Tibet, Holy Land, center of the universe, Earth's soul, the heart of the world, a relatively little known and mysterious land of snow high up in the Himalayas, bordering Nepal, Bhutan and India. Protected by the highest mountains in the world, this is a region that developed a unique society whose philosophy, art and religious faith has earned much interest and respect. Lhasa, the holy city and place of the gods. The capital of Tibet and also its largest city, a land that is now an autonomous region of China. This is a sacred road that travels around the Barkhor Temple. It serves as both a market and gathering place for all kinds of vehicles. The Barkhor Road extends for 800 meters around the Zhokang Temple and nearby Suklahang Square. For the faithful, a visit to the Zhokang Temple is the highlight of a long and arduous pilgrimage. Finally, the pilgrims are close to their longed-for destination. Outside the temple's main entrance, there are large numbers of pilgrims, so another entrance is made available. The Dalai Lama once sat in the inner courtyard during the monk's annual final examination, which is also a splendid festive event. So the Zhokang temple contains much decoration. Despite the speedy modernization of this village that has grown into a city, it has managed to retain its timeless character. Picturesque inner courtyards are reminiscent of old picture books that feature the exotic world of the Tibet that was once almost totally unknown by the outside world. In the north of the old town is another important temple, Ramoche. Built in the 7th century and destroyed several times by fire, it has, however, been lovingly rebuilt. This ancient place of culture contains an academy of the esoteric Galupka sect, as well as a higher Tantra institution that teaches Buddhist texts to the monks. Now more than 50 monks live here. It is also a pilgrimage destination. A new building of traditional design, the Tibet Museum, features numerous works of art from various epochs from prehistory right up until the time of the monarchy. The history of Lhasa began in the 7th century when the 33rd Tibetan king Songsen Gampo relocated here from Yalung Valley. Even then man had a good understanding of the world. Chinese immigrants introduced their culture to this remote mountain world, including the traditional evening market that is now very much a part of everyday life here. The Tianhai evening market is situated in a large hall that contains several corridors. The various shops are packed in quite tightly and they boast a large variety of goods. Opposite Potala, and nestling on a rock wall is a small and ancient cave sanctuary, the Palupuk Temple. Steep steps lead up to the first level of the temple that was once used to calm down various rock and water deities who were disturbed by the construction of the Zhokang. The pilgrims are mesmerized by the colorful sacred paintings. The Lhasa River is one of the tributaries of Yalung's Zangbo River. 
It flows through both the city and colorful high valley. In the seventh month of the Tibetan calendar, the Tibetans bathe here and wash their laundry. It's believed that the water has a healing effect. Everything here is huge. The square plus the train station and its platforms. China made it possible. A train journey to the roof of the world. The King Haiye Express that travels from Peking to Lhasa. This new railroad is one of the most ambitious projects of the People's Republic of China. 1120 kilometers of railway track, 286 bridges, and the highest located train station in the world. Custom-built pressurized wagons guarantee a necessary supply of oxygen. Tibet will derive much benefit from this railroad, even though almost half the route travels through permafrost regions that are earthquake prone. A special cultural highlight is the show theater, Happiness on the Way, with its review of the same name. Here, age-old traditions are performed. In the style of a Las Vegas show, Tibet's mystical history is performed, with splendid costumes, acrobatics, and exotic music. Now it's harvest time. The people are grateful. Finally, they're able to harvest what they've sowed. All their hard work has reached fruition. With each new stage setting, their joy increases. A group of musicians joins the actors, and the successful harvest is celebrated in both song and dance. Tibetan monks move in total harmony in front of a huge Buddha painting. But now, back to reality. On the other side of the Shak Pori, a small mountain opposite Potala, is the seldom visited Sangya Tongku Temple. Hidden away and therefore off the tourist trail, this temple of a thousand images of God is nevertheless very popular among devout Buddhists. It is a place of silent prayer. The outer pilgrim's route around Lhasa heads past this temple, hidden away from the hectic life of the city. Mighty and eternal, the Potala looms up in the center of the city, one of the most unique palaces in Asia. Long before the Dalai Lamas, this palace mountain and its close surroundings served as the location for the residences of Tibet's monarchy. There was subsequently a manifestation of the new power of the Yellow Academy that has, right up until the present day, lost nothing of its importance as a highly religious location. Those incarnated living gods whose successes were the reincarnation of the same soul. And the Potala is a symbol of their spiritual and worldly power. Outside Lhasa is a large park complex that measures 360,000 square meters. Hidden beyond a white external wall is a splendid structure. Norbuling Ka, former summer residence of the Dalai Lamas. There was once a willow grove here, before a representative of the Chinese Emperor of the Qing Dynasty ordered the construction of a palace for the seventh Dalai Lama. It was later enlarged and given its present name. It was built during the reign of the seventh Dalai Lama, but it was the eighth Dalai Lama who was the first to live here.
This 18th century pavilion blends harmoniously into the landscape of the park and creates a wonderful atmosphere. Its main entrance is decorated with several lion figures that highlight the majestic character of the building. Daran Migyo was the seventh Dalai Lama's first palace. The small complex is in excellent condition. However, it cannot conceal the sad, historic fate of this beautifully situated summer residence. The jeweled garden was abandoned in 1959 when the last Dalai Lama was forced into exile. On the western edge of Norbuling Ka Park is a building that dates back to the 20th century the palace of the 13th Dalai Lama. The God King gained much respect in the political world and thus brought about many reforms during his rule. But there was one thing that he couldn't achieve. Although he brought independence to Tibet in 1912, it was not given international acclaim. So Norbu Ka became a leisure park for the local population, an oasis of relaxation. In the environs of the city, three large monasteries were once important centers for the Yellow Cap sect, Drepong, Ganden and Sera. In 1417, construction of the monastery began. Zhamchen Shuji, a pupil of Song Kapa, chose this place that also had a number of hermit's caves. In former times, Tibet's Sherlin Temple stood here, a place in which monk soldiers and guards were educated. Serar, the earliest of the three monastery towns, also possesses three academies and is a popular sightseeing destination. The monks of Serar were well known for their quick thinking and the discussion garden is still used for emotional arguments that are accompanied by enthusiastic clapping. More than 5,000 monks once lived here. Today, there are around 200, and the three academies still enjoy an excellent reputation. In 1959, several of the monks broke their vows and fought against the Chinese, whereupon the Chinese army fired upon the monastery. As many demonstrations for Tibet's independence begin here, a visit to the monastery can sometimes be a little risky. Ten kilometers west of Lhasa is one of the most important monasteries in Tibet. A pilgrimage trail leads up to Dripung Gomba that was built in 1416 by a follower of Tsong Kapas, founder of the Gilog Order. Monasteries played an important role in the state system of Tibet. Following China's takeover of power of Tibet, the Drepung ceased as a center of government. Yet it is an historic place. Long before completion of Lhasa's Potala Palace, this monastery was the residence of the predecessor of the Dalai Lama.
In just a short time, the monastery that was founded by Zhamzhan Chuji at the beginning of the 15th century grew into a small township of monks. As the abbots of Drepung were involved in the country's most important political decisions, the monastery was often at the center of hostilities. Mongolian Dzungaren and Koshoten armies destroyed much of the monastery complex. During the first part of the 17th century, under the fifth Dalai Lama, Drepung was enlarged. Many important spiritual leaders studied at one of the monastery's four faculties. The monastery's large kitchen is well organized. The number of monks declined following the Cultural Revolution. Once around 10,000 monks lived in Drepung, today there are 500. In addition to the portraits of various Dalai Lamas, the altar wall of the Dukhang, the central meeting hall of the faculty, contains 1,000 small Chong Kapa statues. The political influence of the abbots continued until the 20th century, but every now and then hostilities flare up. When the 13th Dalai Lama attempted to banish the Han Chinese from Tibet, open conflict broke out. Around 60 kilometers east of the city of Lhasa, capital of Tibet, and set amid the untouched mountain world of Kuiju Valley, is the town of Dagzi, that contains one of the country's most famous monasteries. Gandan Gomba was once a prosperous monastery town. However, this historic Tibetan landmark was badly damaged when the Chinese took power and introduced the subsequent Cultural Revolution. But despite the destruction, Gandan Gomba is still a sacred destination and a very popular place of pilgrimage. For many centuries, this temple town was the religious center of the Yellow Caps Academy. But the annexation of Tibet by China changed everything. It's believed that the founder of both the monastery as well as the Gelug Academy, Chong Kapa, once taught here. Artistic mandalas, circular symbolic images, decorate many of Ganden's temple buildings. Some of the buildings are original, while others have been renovated. From the large assembly hall and the chapel of the protective deities, it is only a few steps to the tomb of the monastery's founder, Tsong Kapa. This is the most holy place in Ganden Gomba. A visit to the final resting place of this important spiritual teacher is the main aim of the pilgrims that have come to Ganden from near and far. The sanctum of the monastery complex has an extraordinary atmosphere, full of mystique. Following the Cultural Revolution, the temples of the monastery town lay in ruins for many years prior to the gradual restoration of these historic buildings. The Holy Throne of Tsong Kapa is located between his tomb and also his former residence. A small throne hall that still contains a special atmosphere. 
The historiography of this famous monastery in the Kiju Valley continues, and even the local printing press is operational once more. At a length of 2,900 kilometers, the Zhangpo is one of the main rivers in Asia. It has its source in the west of Tibet, and in eastern India it flows into the Ganges. In Yalong Valley, the river is broad and slow flowing, and nestles between two mountain ranges. When the snow melts, the water level rises. In eastern Tibet, the Zhangpo River flows through the deepest canyons in the world and in a relatively short distance descends from an altitude of more than 3,000 meters. A small road alongside the river travels through a fertile valley, while sheep walk on the road. We soon arrive at a simple building at the roadside that is a landing stage for numerous ferry boats. Suddenly, a small boat appears. The river was once an important trading and pilgrimage route. Now there are buses and pilgrims traverse the river by boat. Passengers are packed onto a small ferry boat, and often entire families must patiently and courageously survive the 30-minute journey. These pilgrimages are part of the ritualistic lifestyle of the Tibetan people. Sometimes they travel for several weeks from one monastery to another. Finally, we approach the other side from where the passengers are transported to a remote and isolated location. A unique sanctuary. Samye Gomba, the oldest monastery in Tibet, is one of the most important historic landmarks in Yalung's Valley of Kings. Samye Gomba was built in around 775 AD, a year that marked the beginning of Buddhist monastery culture in Tibet that has survived right up until the present day. At the time when the monastery was founded, the country was anything but peaceful. Hostilities between Buddhists and the followers of Tibet's Bon religion were frequent. A circular wall that contains 108 Chortens surrounds the large monastery complex. The entrances to the sanctuary were once positioned in all four directions of the compass. The Samye Monastery was designed strictly according to the Buddhist principles of the universe. India's temple of Otantapuri served as its model. The main temple in the center of the monastery symbolizes the mystical Mount Meru that is surrounded by four temples, each located in one of the four directions of the compass. The Tibetan king wanted to create a brand new location of religious power and influence. The introduction of Buddhist monastery culture and the decline in the bond system of faith with its demonic beliefs gave Tibetan society a new structure. With the construction of the famous stele and the edict of Tisong Detsen in 779 AD, Buddhism became Tibet's official state religion.
It was only following the symbolic overthrow of the older religion that construction of the Samyeh Monastery complex was completed. Despite its great age and dramatic history, Sam Yi, as an image of the universe, is still one of the most beautiful and unique religious sanctuaries in Tibet. On a precipitous, newly constructed mountain road, we leave the monastery and enjoy a final view across Yalong Valley, birthplace of Tibetan culture. Here, sheep also walk on the road that crosses the partly wooded river valley. The desert-like riverbanks are left behind and are replaced by blossoming nature. Everywhere, diligent farmers work in their fields. The Zhangpo River is the region's lifeline, and the changing seasons determine the daily life of these mountain people. The beautiful river landscape almost hides the fact that we are in a high valley at an altitude of several thousand meters. The slow flowing river is a splendid sight. Its source, like many things on the roof of the world, is a mystery. Although unconfirmed, it most probably lies somewhere in the south of the Kailash. In a tranquil side valley, the remains of a destroyed fortress can be seen from a distance, a former royal residence. From here, the King's Bridge leads to the Valley of Royal Graves, a remote region that was once forbidden to commoners. It was here that the kings were buried. The tomb hill of King Sprongsen Gampo is the largest and most well preserved. Steep steps lead to the plateau where there's another small temple. The king, both his wives and several ministers are worshipped here. The main room of the sanctuary is decorated with wall paintings, Buddhas and protective deities. From here, various hill tombs can be seen that have been covered by stones. It is said that up to 16 monarchs were buried here. Sacred columns mark the area. In the grave chambers, the body of the king was covered with golden dust and laid out in a silver coffin. Clothing, various treasures, horses and five to six men were sacrificed. From the Zhangpo River Valley, a new mountain road snakes its way up to Kambala Pass. The journey on the winding mountain road is a highlight for everyone that visits Tibet and everyone must wait for the occasional yak to cross the road. For shepherds, it's difficult to herd large numbers of sheep on the steep slopes that flank the road. It requires much experience and constant vigilance. After each bend, we expect to see the mountain pass, but instead the road continues to go higher and higher, almost to the sky. Finally, prayer banners and stone mounds greet us, plus souvenir sellers, lovable yaks that like to pose for the camera and outstanding views.
Situated between snow-covered mountains is Tibet's third largest lake, Yam Drokzo. This is Holy Lake and lies at an altitude of 4,482 meters. It shines out in an almost surreal turquoise. Its beauty and the fact that it's easily accessible make it popular with sightseers. The yaks patiently endure the noise as well as the photo session of the mainly Chinese tourists. On the way down to the valley, we discover the overgrown remains of various ancient settlements. The Yalong Valley is full of history, such as possessing the oldest field in Tibet and the oldest village that is located at the foot of the country's oldest fortress, Yombaru Khan, the rock palace of the country's first mystic king. Horses, camels and yaks await those for whom the steep route up to the fortress is a little much. The hardy creatures transport them right up to the entrance gate. King Nyatri Tsenpo was the founder of the Yalong dynasty and in 200 BC, he had this fortress built on a mountain ridge. The fortress was destroyed during the Cultural Revolution, but in 1982, it was faithfully rebuilt and is now to be seen in all its original glory. The strategic location of this building was extremely favorable because from here, the entire Yalong Valley could be observed. According to Tibetan mythology, a foreigner was traveling down a mountain when he encountered some shepherds. They asked him from where he'd come and he pointed at the sky. Thus, the shepherds thought that he'd come from heaven and gave him the name Nyatri Tsenpo. And his six successors were also given divine ancestry. From those monarchs who became famous as the seven heavenly kings, it is said that during the day they lived on earth and at night they went to heaven. The eighth successor was also of heavenly origin, but during an arrogant exchange with his subjects, his connection with heaven was severed and each of the subsequent kings were forced to remain on earth forever. Close by is one of the first Buddhist temple complexes in Tibet, Tandruk a small replica of the Zhokhang in Lhasa. Well-preserved, colorful Buddha reliefs decorate the monastery walls that were built on this site at the command of the wives of Swangtsen Gampo. Two inner courtyards lead to the main meeting hall. Originally, there were 21 temple rooms. After the heavenly kings followed the religion kings, the most famous of whom was Shrongtsen Kampo, who ruled for 29 years.
His rule was an ideal time for Buddhism, and his wives did much to spread the new religion, although for many years this religion was only for the elite. Srong Sen Gampo was thought of as a wise diplomat and brave military leader. He was also known for his domestic reforms. The king introduced the Tibetan calendar, measurements and weight, as well as scripture for which he sent one of his ministers to Kashmir to develop. During his long reign, the creation of the country's first infrastructure began, and simple roads, bridges and canals made remote parts of the country more accessible. The king relocated the capital from the Yalong Valley to around 100 kilometers northwest, to the valley of the Kichu, where the city of Lhasa originated. But back to the Tandruk Monastery. It is said to have been one of 11 monasteries that were designed to guard a female demon. According to legend, the entire area was at that time covered by a large lake. A hostile dragon known in Tibetan as Tandruk lived here and frightened everyone with its five heads, each of which had a different color. It is believed that a great lama succeeded the beast and the king ordered that the lake be drained. His Chinese wife calculated 11 points that eventually restrained the dragon's demon. Thus, this landscape remained at peace. Dan is the capital of Shan'an province. At an altitude of 3,400 meters, this, the country's third largest city, has a population of 20,000. The traffic junction in the so-called southern area that extends to the bordering Himalayan countries has brought all kinds of traffic problems to this remote area. The city is quite commercial and attracts many young people. Western values have found their way into the town and this is gradually transforming thousands of years of age-old tradition. Everything is motorized. People transport goods and repair them from early mornings until late at night, and modern buildings have changed the city's appearance. Everyone has an eye for business. This city is an example of the fast-changing pace of life and modernization that is taking place in this region. The heritage of this ancient culture will soon be a thing of the past. Our journey continues on the only road that travels to the west of the country. There are two more impressive destinations that we plan to visit. Places where Tibet's rich heritage is still very much alive and well. Past snow-covered mountains and through narrow gorges where the Zhangpo River powerfully carved its path. A new road winds through this extraordinary high mountain landscape. For the clouds that have come here from the Indian subcontinent, these mountains form an almost insurmountable obstacle. This brings North India, Nepal, Sikkim and Bhutan much rainfall, yet a relatively temperate climate. The road frequently crosses the river. 
it was adapted to fit in with the natural terrain. Suddenly, we arrive at a desert-like landscape that we must cross on our journey to Gyangsi. Thousands of years of erosion has transformed the stone into sand. Sahara-style sand dunes. Quite a surprise when considering the several thousand meters of altitude. Little by little, the geology becomes obvious, and it seems there's no difference between the Sahara and the central Tibetan high plateau. Proud and mighty, Zong, the fortress of the former monarch of this region, rises above Yangtze, the third largest city of Tibet. This fortress once accommodated the governor of the district and was the region's administrative center. Despite certain obligations, the Zong monarch was relatively independent and was permitted to rule this region and its inhabitants. The special importance of this fortification is also indicated by its name that means highest royal fortress. The view from Zong extends far across the old town of Gyangsi and the nearby monastery district of Palkor Chedi. The surrounding mountains form a dramatic backdrop. Part of the old town in the east of the Gyangsi contains many old farm buildings that have retained their original rural character right up to the present day. The people here live in humble conditions. The picturesque lanes of the town give a very real impression that time has stood still. A rural idyll dominates the streets of the old town. Compared to the Zong fortress, the monastery complex of Palkor Chede is at total odds, yet this contrast adds to the splendor of Gyangsi. Only a handful of buildings serve to remind of the golden days of Tibet's monasteries in Gyangsi. Several of them have been destroyed. The dramatic and cruel images in the Lak Kang, the room of the protective deities in Sukla Khan's main hall, are quite unusual in Lamaist iconography. Sukla Khan, the main meeting hall for each of the monastic communities of Palkor Chude, dates back to 1418. Numerous protective deities create a mystic atmosphere, and the hall's abundant furnishings make it even more intense. One of the largest monuments in Tibetan architecture is the unique Kumbum Choten. It is a three-dimensional mandala that can be entered. Eyes decorate the upper part of the stupa. The ritual walkabout begins on the lowest level with simple deities, then follows the entire pantheon of Tibet, immortalized in both sculptures and wall paintings. Both the original and restored sacred works of art are located in various shrines within the nine-story Kumbum. A total of 68 chapels are situated within the first four stories of the Kumbum, and each is furnished with impressive sacred treasures and deities.
The influence of Nepal is not only indicated by the actual wall paintings. The sanctuary itself was designed by a Nepalese architect. The uppermost room of the 32-meter-high sanctuary is dedicated to Adi Buddha, in Buddhist doctrine, the genesis of all living beings. And even from the roof, there are the all-seeing eyes of Buddha that protect the welfare of the faithful. With its population of 45,000, the city of Shigatsi is not only Tibet's second largest city and administrative center for the south of the country, it also boasts one of the most beautiful monastery districts in the Himalayas. Tashi Lumpo Monastery, or the Mountain of Blessing, is situated at the western end of the city that lies at an altitude of 3,900 meters above sea level and, according to legend, was founded by a hunter. That Tashi Lumpo is today the monastery with the most religious activity in Tibet is indicated by the many pilgrims that come here. This traditional Buddhist monastery is closely associated with the second most important spiritual heads of Tibet, the Panchen Lamas. This is also the location of many magnificent tombs of previous Panchen Lamas. Gedan Dup, a nephew and follower of the famous Tsongkha Pass, laid the foundation stone of this monastery that is still in use today and made history as being the residence of the Panchen Lamas. Yet Tsang province was then in the hands of the non-reformed Buddhist sect of Red Caps that was at the heart of constant hostility. The influence of the Red Caps in Shigatsi came to an end with the takeover of power of the 5th Dalai Lama in the 17th century. However, 1791 brought some misfortune. Nepalese Gurkha troops penetrated Sang province and also Tashilunpo. The monastery complex was plundered by Gurkha soldiers and was partly destroyed. Chinese troops pushed back the invaders. Following the death of a Panchen Lama, the abbots had the responsibility of searching for his incarnation and appointing a successor. According to the records of Sven Hayden, a well-known Swedish geographer and discoverer, almost 4,000 monks lived here at the beginning of the 20th century. With the annexation of Tibet by China in 1959, the monastery experienced further disarray. Most of the monks were forced to flee abroad. Fortunately, China's cultural revolution caused the buildings little damage, unlike that of other Tibetan monasteries. The Tsuklang Hang of Tashilunpo was built on a special site, that of an ancient and sacred burial place. As in other monastery complexes in Tibet, this one also contained four faculties. And the influence of the Panchen Lama increased and extended to 500 smaller monasteries, including some in both Beijing and Jiangdi. To 
Despite the severe political climate of the recent past, the significance of this monastery for the Tibetan people remains just as strong today as it has always been. Shigatsi and the Mountain of Blessing, the historic Tashilunpo Monastery, will no doubt attract great hordes of pilgrims for many years to come. Despite Chinese influence, Tibet is still a religiously devout country with a fascinating monastery culture and amazing natural scenery. Tashi Derek, happiness and blessings. On the roof of the world, one is always close to the gods.